In this tutorial, I'm going to be showing you how to optimize a rigid body simulation. Now, the main goal of optimizing a rigid body simulation is increasing the speed that the rigid body solver can solve at, therefore making the simulation when you watch it on screen go by quicker and smoother to the point where you can watch it in real time or 24 frames per second. Let's look at this simple simulation we have here. We have some spheres and we have a plane. Now, this simula I mean, this scene truly lends itself to being optimized. And I'll show you an unoptimized pass followed by an optimized pass. Now I'm just going to set up a very quick and simple rigid body simulation. I'm going to use this floor plane as an act, I mean as a passive rigid body so it won't move. And all of these spheres are going to be active rigid bodies. Reset the settings so, so they're at their default and click create. Now to make something happen when I play the animation, we're going to go to fields and add some gravity. Now I'm going to open up my preferences and make sure the playback speed is set to play every frame. That way we can see the true simulation rate of our rigid body simulation. Click save and now we're going to play. Now I'm not sure how good this will look on the video capture but it should give you a general idea that this is a very slow painfully slow simulation. Really, we're looking at a frame rate probably about one frame per second, but I'm just guessing here. We do have a way of showing you exactly how fast your rigid body simulation is simulating. We're going to go to display, heads up display, and turn on frame rate. Now over here in our bottom right corner of our screen we have this number. This shows you the frame rate of the scene when your animation's playing. I'm going to click play. We start off at 20, then it drops to 9, 4, 2. Yeah, we're looking at one frame per second really here. That's horribly, painfully slow. We're looking at less than a frame per second. This is painfully slow, so I'm just going to stop it now. And the reason for that is, when you look at the scene, it's really quite a simple thing for a computer to simulate. We have a flat object followed by some circular objects and mathematically a circular object can be simulated quite quickly as you can just base it on a radius so there's no need for any complex computations for intersections and stuff like that but the reason it's slow is because Maya has no idea this is a sphere all it sees is a whole bunch of polygons and vortexes and I'm going to show you just how many I'm going to go to display heads up display poly count another very useful option to have on your screen when you're trying to increase your simulation time and I'm going to select all these objects and we're looking at over we're looking at over 48,000 vortexes on all of these objects and that's 48,000 vortexes it has to compute intersections for that's very slow for a computer to work with um, another thing I should mention is that one sphere alone has over 300 vortexes almost 400 vortexes so that's horribly unoptimized now what we're going to do is tell Maya it's a sphere using a rigid body, I mean an active rigid body option. It's actually also available for passive rigid bodies. I'm going to reopen the scene, turn this into a passive rigid body again, and now when I select all these spheres, go to create active rigid bodies, open up the options, but this time I'm going to check probably the most important option under performance attributes and create a stand-in. Now a stand-in is like a proxy. I'm going to set it to sphere. That basically means what Maya is going to do is it's going to create its own sphere based on a radius around our spheres. So when we render we will see our spheres but when we simulate it will be simulating based on a radius much quicker. I'm going to click create and now I'm going to add some gravity and now we're going to play our animation. Keep your eyes on the frame rate over here. We're looking at 15, 16, 18, 19, looking at about I'd say 18, 19. As the spheres fall off and disappear into space our frame rate will go up. But this is a large improvement. At least 18 times faster than what we were working with before. And that was a, an example of a very very easy to optimize scene and truly something you should always take advantage of. So now I'm going to look at a slightly more difficult example. 
Now we have a lock sitting above a floor plane. And you can tell just by looking at it, it's made up of a lot of polygons. Again, the more polygons, the longer it takes to simulate because Maya has to calculate all those pesky intersections. Now if we were to just combine this as one object and then dynamics, I mean throw some dynamics um, simulation on it with gravity and then have it fall onto this plane, we'd probably get a million intersec intersection issues. And I'm not even going to run it as it would probably cause my computer to crash. So what I'm going to do instead is start off with optimizing it. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is go to Polygons and make it one object by going to Mesh Combine. Then I will delete history as always delete history when you're working with any sort of rigid body simulations before you convert it into a rigid body. It seems to help simulation with intersections and all that and overall prevents glitching. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is create our floor plane as a passive rigid body again. Reset the settings, make sure everything's okay. Click create. And now for this object, this object it doesn't look a thing like a sphere, but it does look a little boxy. So maybe a box proxy would work appropriately or stand in. So I'm going to create an active rigid body. Go back down here to performance attributes and set the stand in to a cube. Then click create. Now I'm going to add a couple more frames down here and play the animation. Oop, almost forgot to add some gravity. And now I'm going to play the animation. As you see, we're sitting at over 100, 200 frames per second. That's great. That's real-time speed. And since it's over 24 frames per second, we can go into our preferences and set the playback speed to real-time as our simulation is fast enough it can keep up. So here's what our lock dropping looks like in real time. Now this looks great. No intersection issues. Seems to be bouncing in a natural way if a lock bounced. Very good, but let me show you a flaw with this technique. Say we were to select it and rotate it. I'm just going to flip it over. And we want to look really closely at the tip of this lock. Get a good angle. Notice how it bounces before it ever touches the ground? That's because basically what Maya is doing is creating a box around it. It won't account for the tapering off of this hoop up here. Here's what the proxy Maya is creating right now would generally look like. I'm not 100% sure if this is dead accurate, and it probably isn't. But this is generally what you're looking at for proxy. That's what it's covering this lock with. So as you can see, we have a lot of gap or airspace right around in here, right around in these corners. As you see, our object has some taper to it. So that means here and here won't have accurate intersections or collisions at all. And that's a major flaw in using this sort of optimization. Now I'm going to show you how you can create your own proxy object, which will still simulate faster than the original, but allow for a little closer interpolation between objects. I'm going to reopen the scene go to our modeling menu set. Once again, combine the objects. Delete history. This time I'm going to center the pivot because it makes it easier to rotate. And I'm going to create my own proxy geometry. Um, really, creating proxy geometry is just like modeling in Maya. There's no special trick to it, except you want to always keep in your back of your head, well, in front of your head, actually, keep the polygons down because that's the number one goal. So try and use as simple a shape as possible. That looks very good. Something like that. It's generally a shape. And here's a cool thing about it. You don't have to make it out of one object. We can use two cubes to make our proxy object. So I'm going to just bend this in a bit. We want to get this corner quite close. I'm going to go above it. I'm going to just slice it in two. Now I'm going to turn on snap to grid to make sure it's in the center. I'm just doing normal modeling stuff, nothing special scaling that out of it. So you have very close intersections here, which is much better. And now what I'm going to do is duplicate it and use this for the top piece. Just scaling it, making some minor adjustments. I'm going to turn that off. And now for this tapering up here, I'm going to simply extrude and then taper in as I extrude. 
which should work just fine. Goal is to get it close. It doesn't have to be 100% because, well, you wouldn't want to use this in a hero shot and anything, but it will work just fine for almost everything else. You just want it close enough that when the viewer sees it, they don't think there's anything wrong. Now I'm going to go to vortex mode to make sure it's pretty close. We should probably bring this down and out a bit more. Keep this contour line here a little neater. We can bring this in smidge too. And we'll bring that down as well. Like I said, this, this is just normal modeling. Okay, so now we're done. We got pretty close. I normally find it's better to have it slightly larger instead of slightly smaller. It's less obvious, but really you want to put it right on the line. So there we go. Now I'm going to combine these two objects. Delete history. Center the pivot. Make sure the transformations are frozen. And we're ready to start simulation simulating. So we're going to start off as we normally do. Dynamics. Passive rigid. Reset the settings create but now here's the point where you want to make sure you do it in the correct order otherwise you'll completely blow any optimization you'll be performing because if we were to um, what well, basically what we're going to do in a second here is we're going to parent the original lock I mean make the original lock geometry a child to our new proxy geometry now if we were to do this first when we convert our proxy object into our active rigid body it will include our original lock in the equation so we won't be improving our simulation time at all we'll actually be increasing it that's really a uh, undesirable idea so what we have to do is create our rigid body first then parent our lock geometry to it now I'm going to go to dynamics I'm already there create active rigid body settings are reset click create now I'm going to select the original model then this active rigid body and create a parent. Now I'm going to add some gravity and we're going to play the animation. I'm going to reset it to play every frame so we can see its true frame rate again. And once again we're running very fast up in the 200s. But unlike last time when we rotate it we're going to be getting a much closer and much more accurate simulation. As you can see, it's tilting down like it would in real life. Now, here's one downside to this. As you can obviously see, when we go to render this, we're going to see this big ugly box on top of our lock. Nobody wants that, so here's probably the best way of fixing that. Go to um, Window, Hyper Connections, and we're going to go down here to look for the initial shading group node and we're looking for this little purple line that connects the polysurface shape node to the initial shading group or this could be a different shading group if you added a shader to your proxy geometry for some reason and select it, just normally select it and press the delete key what this does is it disconnects it from your rendering so it will be displayed as a wireframe in your viewport and will not be rendered very handy play our animation and we're good to go that's some techniques on how to optimize your rigid body simulations. Thanks for watching this tutorial.